Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you for the invitation and for that uh, amazing introduction. Uh, I agree, yes, that, there's not enough stuff uh, out there. I could do way better. I could do much more. Uh, part of that is working on a, sound, on a field recording course, but that's going to happen uh, when I have some time, probably later. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, looks good. Okay, awesome. So yeah, hi everyone. I'm George Vlad. I am based in Brighton in the UK. I'm originally from Romania. I work as a sound recordist and sound designer, and I'm very happy to be here. I I followed. I mean, I've I've used all about birds and uh, and stuff that Cornell University and the 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 ornithology group put out on the internet. You know, it's it's a, an amazing resource, and I'm very happy to to be here. So I'm originally from Romania, from Eastern Europe. I grew up in a, in a very small village. You know, this was about uh, the 80s. So it was a very different time, very different place. I remember going out in these fields, in these uh, little forests and exploring, going out foraging for mushrooms, for berries and going out with my friends. You know, I, I was this was before I went to school. So it was five, six years old. And I, we didn't have any adult supervision. It was safe, and it was uh, it was a, a good life life lesson, and it taught me a lot of things about exploration, and the environment, and nature, and wildlife, and that's been a constant in my life. As I, after I've moved away from that place, I, I keep going back there every you know, twice or three times every year. I still do sound recording over there. I still connect with my my childhood friends. But that has uh, has showed up in my career over time. Um, at the moment, I work as a sound designer and sound recordist and composer and audio person, and I do all kinds of things. I've worked, I've uh, contributed sounds to all of these projects and to lots more. And I have a few other things I can't really talk about just yet, but I'm very excited to, to share when they are released next year. I work on... Um, TV series, on movies, on video games, on you know podcasts, audiobooks. I work with uh, with brands like Sennheiser and Zoom, and others, uh, testing equipment and helping them with the research. And I I do a lot of things basically. Yeah. One thing I do that uh, overlaps a lot with with the work uh, you guys probably you all probably do here is acoustic ecology for media. And this is a very, uh, very small niche that maybe a few, a handful of people can, you know, can do for for video games and for other media. I've done this for a game called. We go back here. You can see there, Horizon Forbidden West. My task was to bring the game world to life using natural sound. Most of it uh, was recorded by myself, and then this was during the pandemic, so I couldn't travel. There was a lot of stuff that I had to to hire other people to to capture for me in the US because the, the, the game world is set in the United States. My task, as I said, was to bring the game world to life. So I had to come up with recordings of geophony, biophony. I had to come up with relationships between the species that we were portraying. So for example, if you hear raptors, you know, you were you're supposed to hear alarm calls in the distance, you know, from species that would be these raptors prey. You if you think about uh stealth in a game where you're you're basically being uh, very quiet so as to not uh, be discovered by your enemy. You know, the, the animals would not notice you for a while. And then as soon as they do notice you, there's an explosion of alarm calls and birds flying away. And then also there's the, when do these birds call? Do they call at dawn? You know, do they call during the day? Do they call at night? What kind of uh, geographical features do, do you associate these species with? What kind of time of the year do you expect them to call? And then this game takes place uh, like in a, in a dystopian future, some few thousand years into, into the future. And I had to think about species movement over you know long periods of time. And also I had to kind of to make the game sound a bit more interesting. So I had some creative freedom there. So I put some some sounds from my travels, you know, from my recordings from Borneo and the Congo. And the way I kind of justified that is, you know. There's lots of people who buy uh, African gray parrots, for example, and they keep them as pets, which is very sad and you know shouldn't shouldn't happen. But thinking about the future of humanity, right? Some you know if if people all of a sudden stop existing on Earth or only maybe a handful of people are, are left, 
some of the, these animals are going to, are going to break away to escape and establish populations. And obviously, you're going to hear them in, in, the, in the game world. So there was a lot of thought that went into this. And a lot of it was, you know, based on all these books I have here, I had a generous budget for, for documentation and for research for this game. It was a lot of fun to, to work on. I got to travel a bit and to, and to record as well. It, you know, it's it's something I want to see more because you I'm a bit annoyed when I when I watch something or I play something and it's supposed to be accurate, and then you hear the screaming Pia in the Congo, for example, or, or something random like that. Even if not, a lot of people are going to recognize or, or be aware of that. I think accuracy is pretty important. Moving on, I think you are all uh, familiar with how things happen in the field. Obviously, in the studio, it's much easier to plan things and to record sound and to, you know, do whatever you plan. You know, if, if you want to spend the day recording a certain thing, you're going to do it. And at the end of the day, you have something to show for. In the field, you, you know, there, there's a lot more unknown factors. Cars are going to break down. People are not going to show up. Uh, you're going to lose your luggage or it's going to get misplaced or delayed. There's a lot that can go wrong. So for me, this was a this was a learning curve. I've started going on expedition something like 15 years ago, and ever since then I, I'm I'm learning and I'm still learning. And every time I go somewhere else, I have to to you know to make notes and to to learn more things and to get into that mindset of you know you're not in the studio, so you you have to kind of make do. You have to be very flexible. And with that comes uh, need the need to be a leader. Every time I travel, I have a local team that I work with. And then maybe there's people who join me. There's uh, my wife who joins me quite often. I have friends, photographers and sound recordists. And, you know, generally people who are who are into this sort of travel. And I have to be the leader because I come up with these ideas. I come up, I do my research. I plan the trips. And they... The, the the people who travel with me they expect me to to step up to this position which was, is not very comfortable it, it not it used to be something i hated i didn't want to be the center of attention i just wanted to be there in the corner doing my own thing and not minding anyone but now you know i found myself can you excuse me just one sec done I, when, when I'm in the field now, I have to think about uh, how, you know, how do we communicate in case there's an emergency? Where are we going? You know, what is our support on the ground? How do we travel? When, how long are we supposed to be there? How do we communicate with our loved ones back home? How do we, you know, do we have someone back home who's in touch of, uh, with, with the authorities or with anyone uh, who can help in these, in these situations? There's a lot of it. There's a lot of the thought that goes into it, a lot of planning. But if you don't do this step, you know, the, the odds that your trip is going to go wrong, you know, they, they grow exponentially. So the more work you do leading the expedition and planning it correctly, the easier it gets afterwards in the field. And that doesn't mean it's, uh, it's very easy, as you probably all know. You, you get there and you realize there's, there's a lot of things that have changed. You know, the plans change all the time. You have to be flexible. You have to work with people. You have to, to, be, to be accommodating and... You know, easygoing, but also quite firm sometimes and quite assertive. It's a it's a never learning uh, process, I guess. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, local teams. For me, it's very important to work with someone local whenever I'm somewhere uh, that I'm not familiar with. And even when I'm even when I go back to the place I grew up in back in Romania, things have changed since I was a as a young person there. It's not the same anymore. I have a friend who's a ranger in the area. And every time I go there, he shows me something new. You know, there's new species moving. There's things uh, that have disappeared over time. New locations that I, I have to check out. There's places where there's been heavy logging. So nothing is, is happening anymore. You know, it's just basically a, a desert. Um, the importance of, of local teams is is very easy to to overlook. I know people who think, uh, you know, you go to, to, you go to an African country like Kenya or something and it's fairly easy to do a self-drive, so you're just going to rent a car and do it on your own. But you're going to miss out on so many things and your, you know, cultural aspects, um, hidden things, stories, things that people learn during their lives. It's not something you can just pick up over a two-week trip or something like that. So for me, this is a very important aspect. And of course, giving back. Um, I've worked with a lot of people 
in you know so called uh, the the global south and it's you see you see so much interest and so much passion and and people can do a whole lot with very little uh i've seen that you know growing up in romania it was a very similar situation um i've met some conservationists who have very little funds but they can do so many things they can make a huge difference so for me it's very important to give back whenever i i work with someone and even you know, meeting people who, who are keen to to protect nature and to conserve environments and to work with wildlife. For me, this is a very, it's a huge thing. So as much as I can, I carry lots of extras on the trip. And at the end of the trip, I'm going to, I'm going to leave rechargeable batteries, you know, bird books, um, little cameras, camera traps. I've, I bought a bunch of the, um, what they call the audio moths. And I gave them to a friend of mine who's a ranger back in Romania, because he knows there's, uh, there's illegal, and while I'm shooting over there, there's poaching happening, but he doesn't know where. One of the ways for him to, to do that is to record with, with those audio moths and then look at where, you know, which location seems the closest to where the shooting is happening. And there, hopefully, he can work to prevent that or do some outreach. It's, uh, you know, it's a never-ending job. It's often thankless, but giving back is huge for me. You know, I, I want to support as many of these organizations as possible. And as a matter of fact, today is the last day that we're raising money. There's me, Thomas Rex Beverly and Andy Martin, uh, three sound recorders who, you know, we're, we're good friends and we're raising money, money for three NGOs. And we, I think we raised more than $12,000 over the last five years for these NGOs. And I'm very happy to, to be able to be in a position to do all of this, you know, to have a platform to, raise awareness about these things. And again, even uh, teaching people, it's, it's still part of giving back for me. You know, I'm, I was planning to, to release a sound recording course uh, for a price, you know, through some kind of platform or something. But I think the people who would need uh, access to that the most would not benefit from it. So I'm, I'm just going to put it out on YouTube. Probably this is, uh, this is what I've uh, concluded. I want everyone to be to, to have access to this sort of knowledge. It's not, uh, it's not gonna make me rich one way or another. It's not a, a huge thing, but I think it, if it can make a big difference for someone, then I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to do it. So some, some of the work I do revolves around uh, sound effects. Sound effects are, are recordings of very focused things using directional microphones, ideally, um, excluding the sound of the environment, the reflections, these these recordings are very useful for sound design and films and video games for creature sounds and for you know whatever it's a it's a very big market and people are becoming more and more aware of how important a good sound effects library is but when i travel somewhere new when I, if it's a place that i've not been before i have to get a feel for the place first i have to be out in the environment immerse myself listen a lot and record soundscapes which is, you know, on this spectrum is quite the opposite. It's, it's recordings of, of the, the entire habitat or environment with lots of things happening at the same time, with the sounds of the environment, with reflections. And from my experience and from my uh, experience as a human, people often enjoy listening to soundscapes much more than they listen to sound effects or, or creature calls. So, you know, from... Uh, the, the beginning of an expedition to the end, I start recording soundscapes. I start getting a feel for the, the whole habitat and then gently hone into certain creature calls or, or wildlife calls or elements of geophony. And it's, um, you know, I, I never choose one over the other. I try to record both. And I try to, to think about it in terms of this is the sound of a habitat. And then I will try to record elements of that. So, I, so I'm able to, to recreate that in a video game or in the in the context of a film later, it's um it's a lot of fun. It's it's why I live. You know, it's a, it it gives me so much pleasure to to go to a new place and to document it in that way. And it it might not be the approach that um, scientists have. Uh, I I do it very organically. I just go somewhere and if something uh, if there's something I enjoy listening to, I'm going to try and record it for days or weeks. Um, and to categorize things even further, we can think about the sounds um, in this part of uh, Ethiopia, which is uh, it's a photo I took 
four years ago in northern Ethiopia. If we think about geophony, geophony is the sound of the non-living things, right? You probably already know this. I'm not teaching you anything new. Biophony, the sound of, uh, of wildlife, of, of living things, probably including humans as well, in, including anthropophony as well. I know scientifically or, or you know, in, in terms of sound design, people like to split it into biophony and anthropophony, and you want to keep one away from the other. You want to record the, the sound of nature that does not include the sound of traffic and people and industry. And there are reasons to do that. But at the same time, we may end up thinking of ourselves as humans um, being beyond, you know, biophony, beyond nature, being superior to everything and some kind of, a, you know, it, it's not a very sustainable approach. It, it's what led us to, to this uh, kind of situation where we're just taking advantage of everything in the environment. But again, going back to the purposes of sound design, biophony is the sound of nature and wildlife as maybe it was 2000 years ago or something. So, you know, and then there's all, all kinds of overlap here. You can think about introduced species. Are they part of biophony? Are they anthropophony? Who knows? Um, maybe the sound of a rooster in, in Gabon, you know, in a soundscape of otherwise wild sounds is not worrying or is not the wrong thing to have but if you want to play that back in a video game you want to to somehow get rid of it otherwise it's going to sound odd or it's going to make the player feel something that is not supposed to, to feel and again yeah that leads me on to sound and story this is probably very different to what scientists do for me story is the most important aspect if i go somewhere to record something i want to have that sound to play it back to to someone and to make someone feel something about you know whatever it is that that sound is or means um i've heard people say sound is 50 percent of the story i've heard people say it's more it's less you know visuals are probably more or less we are a very visual culture we like to to measure things that way i don't think any element of, of storytelling is a certain percentage because as soon as you get into that you start to lose the, this effect that having everything all together has for me, sound plus visuals plus words plus you know whatever else you can include there is storytelling. And of course, yes, that's a very good uh, observation. St scientists need to tell a story. That's one way to present your findings. If you only do reports and scientific communication, people are going to tune out. You know they don't really that that can become very dry very quickly. If you tell a story, you can communicate it much more nicely to people. You can reach more people. And obviously, every today everything is 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 reach, right? If you don't have enough reach on your social media, no one's going to know about you. If you don't talk to enough people, what's the point of uh, of doing the stuff you're doing? I'm not sure. This is a bit reductive, but um, yeah, telling a story is quite important. And some sounds can tell a lot of stories. I've recorded a, a, a lot of amazing sounds. I'm not going to play anything because uh, it doesn't translate well over the internet over Zoom. But you're welcome to check out my YouTube channel. There's hundreds of hours of recordings on there. Again, this is uh, this is probably related more to sound design than science. Mono to stereo and surround. Mono sound effects, as I said earlier, there there are sounds that are very focused in the sound of a certain animal, a certain species, a certain event. And then if you go into stereo, you can already hear the sounds of a space or the sounds of a um, of a habitat. And surround gives you even more channels and more options to to replicate, to recreate uh, the feeling of being in that in, in the field, basically. Equipment. This is a, is an important one. In my uh, field of work, people talk about something called gear acquisition syndrome, which means basically when you see someone having a, a new microphone or a new recorder, it makes you want to buy that new piece of kit. And then it, feel, it makes you feel like you're not a good enough uh, sound recordist or sound designer if you don't have that certain piece of kit. I'm not sure if scientists go through the same thought process. Maybe, as far as I know, a Zoom H4n is usually enough to, to gather data in the field. Or if you have to have 20 of, uh, of a certain rig, you're not going to think about buying the latest Sennheiser microphone. But it's still, it's a, it's a trap. Uh, it's a very slippery slope. If you start focusing on things you can buy to make your work easier, or to make your work better or yourself better, there's never an end to it. You can you can keep doing it endlessly, and you're never going to get anywhere. It's uh, I think I, every time someone asks me questions about equipment, 
for example, if I post a recording somewhere and someone says, oh, what microphone did you use to record this? I'm a bit disappointed because is that the, the main thing that you gathered from that, from listening to that sound? Yeah, it's it's a bit limiting. It's uh, usually people starting out will ask many more questions about equipment than people who have a few years of experience. And then to contrast that, I ask people about technique and experience and listening and, and things that are a bit more philosophical, maybe that take a bit more time. When you're starting out, it's very easy to to conflate a good recording for a, a poor recording or a recording that uh, that that's that sounds good for one that sounds less than good. Technique teaches you, you know, being out in the field recording for for a few hours or for days or for weeks and then going back into the studio, listening back to your recordings, learning something from it, going back in the field and making a change. This cycle teaches you many many things that you're never going to learn from watching a YouTube video or reading something or buying a new microphone. And techniques, th these are things that I've I've developed over the years. I cannot say that I've developed these things myself or that I came up with them. It's it's th it, These are things that I picked up at some point from someone else or read about and then just adopted them and perfected them. And now it, it, it's not a trademark. I, I don't like the sound of that. But there are things that I love doing and that seem to to work for me better than others. I, early on in my career, I realized that recording rain is a is a quite challenging and recording it well, not just getting a recording of rain on a porch with the sound of a the reflections from a wall or from or the sound of a rain on a roof or something like that. So my question was, how do I record the sound of rain without these elements and as far away as possible from houses, from people, from vehicles. I came up with this uh, very organic design, uh, twigs that create a sort of platform with leaves on top. Ideally stuff that you find in the environment, nothing brought from the outside, no plastic or no sheeting or anything like that. And this is just a way to, to shield the microphone from direct rainfall. And if it picks up some of the sounds on the on the platform at the top, that's fine. I don't mind it at all. It's also a way to protect your microphones when you're recording in an area that would that you were expecting rain. I've recorded like this in countless rainforests, countless parts of the world, and it's worked out nicely for me. Even animals, you know, they they will find it, they'll sniff around. I've not had any big issues with the with this approach in the past. Obviously, your mileage may vary, so don't take my word for it. Recording wind. Again, this is a, uh, it's, people might think of wind as something that doesn't make any sound. It's, it's true. If you want to record the sound of wind, you have to find something that wind blows through or, or uh, um, you know, makes a sound while, while the wind is, uh, is happening. I was recording trees here, dead forest in Patagonia a few weeks ago. I was using this tree as a shield and still the, the microphones were moving around, the blimps were moving around, it was a bit too much. There's a kind of a limit to the to the wind speed you can record. It's not something you can go out in the field and say, okay, I'm gonna, I, I've, I've mastered recording wind. I still fail at it sometimes. I still have issues. I, I still work on it and perfect my technique. It's worth doing as much as possible. And then if you want to record something that happens during windy times, go out in the field and try and do it and minimize it as possible, as much as possible with the help of wind breaks and natural elements and then the good quality blimps and fur. Drop rigs is, again, this is not my trademark. It's, uh, I've heard this before somewhere. I can't remember where. I've been recording like this for seven or eight years. It's basically unattended recording. You don't do attended recording to capture nature as it is. If you're in an environment you're gonna create some sort of stress and anxiety there, even if you don't notice it right away. Animals are gonna be aware of your presence. They're not gonna act normally, and you're basically not recording what you're trying to record anymore. So I set up rigs. This is actually not a good example because these are fairly big, but this, you know, in, in the Namib, there was not much happening. I was just recording distant sounds. If you're in a forest or in a rainforest or somewhere where there's lots of wildlife, you want to be as inconspicuous as possible. It's what I was telling Ben earlier, with a very small lavalier microphones and with small recorders like this one, you can have a very small package that you can get very good recordings with. 
and it's inconspicuous, so it's not going to cause anxiety or stress in, in the animals. Ideally, it's not going to be uh, damaged or even found by animals or humans. And then you can capture day night cycles over three, four days, sometimes a week, depending on your battery and your power usage. You have to be careful about you know whether it for over three or four days, things can happen in the forest. There can be a great deluge or a big flood or you know hail or whatever so it can destroy your equipment animals can find it uh, famously i had a very annoyed honey badger that destroyed a few of my rigs in zambia a few months ago power is, is a problem as well uh, i use power banks sometimes they there's a problem with the connection so they stop uh, supplying power and it stops recording about 10 hours in or sometimes they just malfunction or they get too hot or too cold so you have, there's, again, this is a technique you have to develop over time. Oh, actually, no. So this is my favorite way to record, not uh, drop rigs. Tree ears. Tree ears is, is something I've found while recording organically in, in the forest in Romania. It's the perspective of a tree, uh, which is, doesn't, doesn't sound very scientific at all. It sounds a bit uh, anthropomorphizing. I like to think about trees as listening persons or, or uh creatures or whatever entities whatever you want to call them a tree vibrates to you know to the sounds of a forest and these sounds whether they the tree is aware of them or not happen and i try to find yes and i try to find roofs and this again this is not a very good image i need to take a better one uh, grooves and things that sort of uh, approximate the the shapes of noses and you know the, the gaps in your face and the ears and w which are called hrtf had related transfer functions. And this is basically how us as humans locate sound, you know, in the in the stereo field. And I think that can happen with trees as well. I don't I don't think it's a very scientific observation, but recording that way for me is a better, is a more satisfying satisfying way to record than uh, using an ORTF bar or some other technique that's been developed by someone 60 years ago. Again, it's very organic. It's not very scientific. It, like a lot of my work, it's it's about feel. You know, you go out into the field, and if it sounds right, whatever. It nothing else matters. You're the the final person who decides if it's worth recording, unless obviously you're you're a scientist. Uh, if you have to do that and show something for it and write a report, it's probably not ideal. And we can talk about environment. You probably have, so I've seen there's a lot of people who, uh, who record in certain in different environments. I'm not sure how, how many of you have done a lot of different ones, but I've mentioned rainforests. What do you do in a rainforest? How do you how do you function and how do you survive? How do you manage to do your work in a rainforest? I was talking to Ben earlier. He was in Sumatra where I was uh, quite recently. It's fairly difficult to keep anything dry, as you probably know. That's a, it's a losing battle. So for me, I don't think about keeping myself dry anymore. My equipment, on the other hand, I bring lots and lots of dry bags and everything is in their own dry bag. It's, it's a bit easier to keep it dry that way. There's a condensation as well. It's, um, yeah, again, it, it's challenging, but it's worth doing because as soon as you get humidity into your microphones and recorders and cameras, there is a very big chance that they're, they're going to start malfunctioning. Some microphones famously start clicking and popping in, in high humidity, which might not be something you can notice on the screen, you know, on the, on the meters. So you, you end up with hours and hours of very diff, difficult recordings to capture that are actually useless because of the popping and clicking. It takes a lot of going back and forward and, and back in the field, back in the studio, noticing what causes those things and trying to, to not um, trying to avoid them. I have some Sennheiser microphones that are very good in high humidity. Shep's microphones, they're they are not great. I only use them in deserts and in areas where there's no humidity. Um, I've also developed a few ways to record, to, to, to treat the microphone. So I have some, I don't have it here to show it to you. It's a very thin fabric that's made of plastic and it's, and they call it acoustically transparent. I've noticed a change, you know, it, it tends to, to dampen a few high frequencies over there but it's better than nothing. And it does render the microphones um, waterproof to some extent. So that you know extends the microphone's life in the rainforest by weeks. Otherwise I would just expect them to die in a few days of, of expo being exposed in, to, to the water. And of course, wildlife, we've talked about this, wildlife can, can destroy your equipment. So if you leave it out there, you have to be careful. 
Desert, yeah, in the desert, sand gets everywhere, dust gets everywhere, and microphones, again, are going to suffer from that. If you get the sand and the dust onto the diaphragm, it's going to cause, cause weirdness and weird vibrations and things you don't want into your recordings. The transition from hot to cold and, uh, oh, you know, it, it, these can be massive temperature differences between day and night. So batteries are going to suffer. The equipment is going to suffer. It's going to be a bit more difficult. Wind, yeah, if you want to record wind in the desert, it's, I've done that for, for a few very cool projects. You have to find things that the wind makes sound through. So, yeah, that, we've talked about it. And rain, this is a good one. I've, you know, okay. I've read about deserts before I... Um... Oh, is that sorry? Okay. Um, I've read about deserts before I went to a desert and famously, sometimes it rains in the desert. I think more, most of my desert trips have, have featured rain in some way or another. I was in the Atacama in January this year and there was crazy amounts of rain. There were, you know, Atacama is supposed to be the driest place on earth and we had thunderstorms every day for a week and there was flooding and it was very difficult to record the sounds of, uh, of the desert. I recorded thunderstorms instead, and it was pretty good. In Namibia, uh, there was a bunch, there was quite a lot of rain as well when I was there three years ago. It's not, you know, especially with climate change, it's not a given anymore that it's it's not going it, to rain might happen. So so yeah, keep that in mind. Savannas, I think this is mostly stuff we talked about. Yeah, heat and dust, big mammals. Yeah, big mammals are a bit more difficult to to deal with. You have to be very careful when you're recording. I've I was once setting up a rig in Zambia and I was so focused and and just looking at what I was doing and there was an elephant very close to where I was. Luckily, I was there with a the ranger and he he came by and he's okay. You should finish in five seconds and then jump in the car. And I was able to finish in five seconds, but then we we had to go back to come back so I could pack it nicely and, and hide it. Um, heat and dust, yeah, we've we've covered that. Wildfires, this is a big thing actually. If you're you're doing if you're recording fire, Ben is asking if I've, I've developed techniques for recording fire. I've not, and I'm not a big fan of recording fire. It's uh, it can be crazy in 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 a tinderbox like the savanna in the dry season. You never know how it's going to behave. You want to be far away from it. I was recording uh, close to a wildfire in Senegal many years ago, and I could hear it from a distance. I, I had no idea. I thought it was a distant generator. But it was that low hum of the fire. It was it was very pronounced. You could hear it very easily. And then there's people starting it. Whenever you there's this uh, one of these wildfire in areas that people tend to share on the edges of national parks, for example, they this is a way it's clash and burn agriculture, right? It's a way for for them to clear land for farming. They might not know you're there setting up equipment. They might set something on fire, set the the, the savanna on fire, and it's a very dangerous place to be because it's a not it's not a legal practice. So they're not allowed to do that. They're going to do it either way. And they they try to be very inconspicuous. They do it and they, they, they drive away and you're left there being maybe being surrounded by little fires that eventually get uh, get to quite a big size. It's yeah, it's not a pleasant. And even if you don't, you know, if you don't uh, you're not in the middle of it, even breathing all that smoke in. I was in again in Senegal when that happened. The fire was just uh, downwind from uh, the city was downwind from the fire. So everyone was coughing in the city for two or three days after that fire was started because all the, the smoke was, and ash was blown over the city. So it's a, it's a tough situation. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm a, I would like to, to spend much time in these areas when there's a fire. Around. At sea, yeah. Again, I've, I've not done a lot of work at sea. I'm lucky to not have, a, a, you know, like I have some amount of, uh, of sickness at sea, seasickness. But not a whole lot. It's mostly when I focus on and I try to do something, you know, very, very when I have to be very focused uh, and everything's moving around me. Otherwise, it's it's fine. Uh, but salt water can can destroy your equipment. That was something I learned the hard way. I had a few. I think it was a pair of headphones that just didn't work anymore. The drivers were were corroded by salt. Cameras can be can be destroyed by lenses can be destroyed by salt water microphones. You have to think about protecting these before you get on a on a boat or, or on a ship to, to to be out recording. Seasickness, of course, you don't want to to be sick on your microphones. You know that's not going to do them well. It's inevitable to some extent if you're you know sailing the Drake, it's going to happen. You don't have a choice. 
if you're sailing around Cornwall in the UK, it might not happen. It's, uh, it might be a bit easier. And wind, of course. Yeah, wind protection is important. What is happening? High altitude. I was in Ethiopia here. This is about 4,000 meters up. Uh, it's very confusing when it happens. You know, you just drive up and everything's fine. And all of a sudden, if you want to go for a quick walk to, to have a listen, you run out of breath and you get a bit dizzy and you have to pee a whole lot because you're breathing so much and you're, you're, everything is, um, your, your body is becoming acidic. And yeah, it, there, there's a lot of uh, physiological things that happen there, uh, phenomena, but you have to read up on this and prepare and acclimatize and think about HAPE and HACE, high altitude pulmonary embolism and high altitude cerebral emb embolism. These are, these can be very, bad things some people die from them and you, you're not really aware of what's happening so when <clears throat> you're at high altitude there's more things to deal with than just protecting your equipment and then obviously you're you're um, more exposed to the elements you can burn while freezing and you know being very cold you're much slower to make decisions and to to think when i was <clears throat> out there in ethiopia I was planning to do at least four hours of recording every day, but I ended up doing one or two hours just because reaching these places, even if I was driving, it took longer. And then I had to walk for a bit. I had to to rest and walk a bit more and then rest. And all of a sudden there was a big thunderstorm coming from beneath us, you know, the the, the edge, the, the um, escarpment is just in the distance over there. So you don't really see it when it's coming, getting closer. So I get, I'm getting a few messages. I'm going to uh, read them a bit later and just go through this. Um, yeah, high altitude is it's not easy. You have to, to acclimatize and repair. Polar and Arctic, cold and humidity for sure. Sun again is a big issue. I was in Patagonia a few weeks ago and it was so sunny one day that we got sunburn all over our faces while like minus, you know, below freezing temperature. And then we had hail and sleet and snow immediately afterwards. Temperature differences is going to affect obviously your your how your microphones behave and how your your batteries behave. Batteries in the cold they tend to have maybe half of their capacity. You know, depending on what temperature it is, you have to think about keeping them slightly warm but not too warm so that uh, there's condensation. There's a lot of work you have to do preparing for such a trip. And then of course my favorite uh, saying: "You sweat, you die." If it's really cold and you're you're working out or you're you know you're uh, physically active, you have to think about layering. Otherwise, if you start sweating and that sweat freezes next to your skin, your temp your core temperature is going to go down seriously. And then there's the risk of hypothermia and, and more serious issues. Overland road trips, which I'm preparing for right now. Um, ready rigs. This is a very cool one. I have little dry bags with one mic one pair of microphones, one battery, one recorder, and maybe some tape. And I have lots of those, maybe 10 or 15, uh, ready to, to deploy. Whenever I find a cool place, you know, I just walk for a bit, have a quick listen, set up a rig and keep going. And I'll obviously mark the location so I can go back and collect it. If you're not ready with these little rigs, it's going to take a whole time to, to find them in your, in your bags. If you're traveling with a little donkey and a, a cart like that, taking up everything, you know, opening everything, looking through, through your luggage, it's going to take way more time than just having everything ready. Tiredness, overland, it's very easy to underestimate how tired you're going to be and how much progress you can make. So I suggest being a bit more conservative. With the ready rig, it takes me five to 10 minutes at most from, you know, finding a place, listening around, finding the, the perfect spot, putting the microphones down, hiding everything. And then, yeah, five to 10 minutes, no longer than that. And quick charge batteries, this is quite important, actually. I have so many different types of batteries. I have one here that was just sent to me by DT. Um, if you're traveling and you don't have a permanent base, you're going to have to charge in the car from the little lighter port in the vehicle. I've got some batteries that charge at 90 watt or 60 watt, and it takes maybe an hour or an hour and a half for them to charge from that port in the car. There are older ones that take three or four times the amount, of, you know, maybe five or six hours. And if you want to record a lot and drive around, it's gonna you're going to have to find a, a sort of a, a solution for charging. Sonar panels are not there yet. 
for the amount of power we need and as a sound, as sound recordist. That's my only solution. I was in the Sahara for seven days off the grid uh, in May this year. And the only way to charge was wake up at 4 a.m., plug the one battery in, that would charge. And then at six or seven, when we would leave camp, charge once more, because maybe around nine, it was too hot for, for batteries to charge. I got a little message saying it's too hot, uh, battery's not charging. So every morning I had to do my charging ritual, and then I would have two or three batteries to use during the day and overnight. And on foot, this is the ultimate. Uh, this is, uh, you can't see the, the rash, I got a fungi. <laughs> this was uh, Sumatra uh, in August. It was a lot of fun to, to explore Gunung Loster National Park, but it was so intense. The place we were at was just on the edge of the park, and we were walking into the park every day and then back. Initially, we planned to uh, to camp and to do more extensive exploration of the park, but we, there were three of us. We all got food poisoning, and we got some other health issues that we had to deal with. So we, we didn't. We never managed to camp. We just walked into the park and back every day for three weeks. And towards the end, uh, there was the trifecta of diseases I caught. So I was I was so weak I couldn't even walk back in the park. So my friend um, Rafi, we can see this in, in his image, and his dad, they went and collected one of my rigs for me because I was I was not able to do it myself. Um, when you're on foot, you're limited to however much you can carry. And then if you have friends or, or porters or a local team that can help you, that's obviously better. But still. You're not going to be able to carry everything, uh, you know, many, many kilos of equipment. And then tiredness. We It took us about five to six hours of hiking uphill and bushwhacking and cutting a path to get to these places where we couldn't hear the village and the scooters and the mosque anymore. And by the time we got that, we I was completely exhausted. I didn't have any energy to go back. So I had to, we had to stop for a bit, you know, set up the rigs. We had to rest, you know, have some food and then go back. You have to manage your your energy levels. You have to think about you know sugary drinks and sugary food that is going to give you a big bit of a kick. Otherwise, you're just going to well, you're going to slide down the, the the hill until you get back to the village, or just you know drift off uh, on the on the river. But yeah, field biologist for sure. This I'm I'm sure I'm not telling you new things uh, when I mention this stuff. Uh, and that was it. That's uh, that's a quick. I think we're, what, 50, 48 minutes. It's a bit over time, but uh, there's some time for questions as well. Shall I, wait, there's a question here from Ben. Cleaning equipment when I get back from all these places. Yes, yes, definitely. If you don't do it, your equipment is not gonna last. So my cameras, I, you know, I've been doing some camera cleaning with these uh, air blowers here. And if it's too, I fell into a big puddle when I was in Romania earlier this year. And it was very muddy and snowy. So, and I, my camera, my Sony A1 fell into the puddle with me. So it was covered in mud, which then dried up. So I had to go to a specialist for it, you know, to clean. I tried to do it myself. I couldn't get it cleaned. I went to a shop here in, uh, in Brighton. It's called um, Camera or something. And they did it for me. Not very expensive. For my equipment, other stuff that, that's easier probably to clean microphones you know we just let the, the the stuff dry you know i use a lot of silica gel packets and put them in a do i have one here to show you i have little tupperware little plastic uh, food cases and i keep one pair of microphones in each of these and just wipe them um dry them keep them as clean and nice as possible i've not had big issues from this I, i've been very diligent about it every evening i do my data management from the day you know copying everything backing everything up and then cleaning up my equipment and preparing for the next day. Sometimes that takes me two or three hours. Everyone's asleep. Everyone's, you know, had their beers and their food, and they're so, you know, talking away around the campfire. And I'm still working, and I sound like a like a boring person. But early in the morning, when they have to wake up and do that work, you know, I can sleep in, and then it's, it's just easier for me. How do I check my recordings? I have a quick listen. Well, in the field, not in the field. If I have a bass usually in the evening. That's part of my uh, ritual in the evening. I copy everything, have a quick listen, try and decide if a certain place is worth going back to or not. Um, if I'm hiking in the forest, you know, for extended periods of time and we're camping, I'm not going to do that. It, it's just too much. There's too much happening for to, to be able to listen. So just swap card. I have lots of cards. But um, on a trip, I will bring something like all of these memory cards and more. And just replace them. Otherwise, it's um, 
it gets a bit tedious. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a photographer as well, and not as uh, my main thing is is sound still. But when I'm not recording, I do I do photography. It's um, yeah, still sound uh, is more important for me than visuals. But uh, I look, I listen to recordings back in the studio. I, when I'm back here, I spend hours every day listening back to my recordings, preparing them. I've got lots of people getting in touch with me to license my recordings to them. So I have to listen back to things, make sure they're clean, make sure they're nothing's unbalanced or wrong. So I used to think about it in terms of catching up. Every time I come back from a trip, I'd have a hundred hours of recordings. Okay, let me catch up with everything. But that's a losing battle. And uh, I've stopped thinking about it like that. I like to listen to my recordings and eventually will probably listen to everything I've ever recorded. But for the moment, I just, you know, I, I want to know what I've recorded on a trip, more or less. I look at the spectrogram. I look at the waveform. If something catches my eye, I'm going to drop a, a marker there, make a note somewhere, and then, you know, go back to it whenever I have time. And then when someone asks me for a certain thing, I know where to listen, what to listen for. Then I prepare something for them. I have these uh, long soundscapes that I upload on YouTube. That I do at least one hour of these on every week. And that, you know, in the process of, of creating that, I listen to many hours of my recordings. That's about it. Was there any other question? With the ready rig, how we've answered that. So Kieran mentioned that He's working on representation learning of soundscapes for ecoacoustics. I've got lo loads of wind recordings. Yes, indeed. Uh, and I'm in Brighton as well, Kieran. So we can uh, we can hang out when I get back. Uh, great, great to get all the good feedback. I'm happy to hear you you found this useful. As I mentioned to Ben earlier, I do things very organically. When I was um, growing up back in Romania, we were not not very affluent uh, by any means. My grandparents were subsistence farmers, so we had to reuse most things. We were, you know, even nails, you know, uh, for, for building, we had to, you know, if you had used them once and then they're a bit, um, you have to straighten them, use them again, reuse everything, reuse bits of wood. So for me at the moment, I'm, my mindset when I'm somewhere is not, you know, how can I bring the most amount of things with me? My mindset is instead, how can I bring the most uh, flexible things? So if something has double or triple uses, I'm more happy to bring them. You know, I can use the environment to my advantage instead of bringing 20 tripods, I'm gonna make them up from little twigs and things like that. It's all about minimizing the impact and, and about adapting and being flexible rather than having to be very stiff and to, to go by the rules and by the, the guidelines. So, you know, that inevitably informs my practice and. I'm going to record if I have 10 rigs out in the forest, it's not going to be on a grid system so that I can replicate or, or study. It's going to have, I'm going to set up my rigs in places where I'm expecting things to happen. Uh, it's going to be river beds, river edges, places with good acoustics, places with lots of wildlife, places with potential for interaction between species or between individuals. It's not exactly the, the scientific approach, which is where I, I'm interested to hear uh, what scientists do, how 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 this happens in the field. How do you approach that? You know, th there's a lot of this that I'm still very new to. So I'm going to probably ask some questions from Ben and I'm going to check out all the other lectures in these series because there's a lot of information that that's just uh, I, I don't have. One question I have, George, um, like right now you're on a pretty impressive pace in terms of the places that you're visiting um and the media that you're putting out um you mentioned the field recording course i'm wondering like if you zoom out do you have any you're clearly on an amazing journey do you have some goal that you're looking forward to in the next five to ten years um, as a way of synthesizing, you know, across your archive or like, you know, go, you know, my former PhD advisor, his dream was to record every biome, um, you know, every biome. Um, so do you have any of those 
goals that are motivating you or is it really just you know you're thinking about where to go next and enjoying the focused on the journey i think it's a bit of both i used to think about recording environments that and habitats that might not be there very soon and that's still that's still valid for me i want to record rainforest that might be cut down for oil palm in a few years or i want to record the cerrado and um in in brazil before it's uh, it's burnt down and i want to record a lot of these these habitats and, and species and environments this year i was planning i already planned about six trips in january and then i had other people come to me in studios and um they wanted me to record other things so i had to fit those expeditions in between my existing plans which resulted in in 11 expeditions so far which was a bit intense i'm, I'm not uh gonna lie i i would like to be home with my wife and my cat more but it, it so happened that i had to be away for longer than i was uh, back home here next year i'm gonna manage my time a bit better i still have a, a job in the studio you know i, I work with uh, media creators with game studios with film studios as well doing sound design so i'm gonna do a bit more of that and a bit less of the travel next year and yeah i'm gonna manage my time a bit better for sure because it gets exhausting but enjoying the journey, that's a, that's a very important aspect. I used to feel, I used to think about travel as a sort of escapism. You know, I wanted to go away and, and have this sort of glamorous lifestyle. Now I'm, I really enjoy that aspect of my life, but being home and taking, having a weekend off and just, you know, doing jigsaw puzzles with my wife or watching a TV series, you know, binge watching something like that. There's beauty in that as well. So enjoying both aspects of this is is important. Otherwise, you get into this never-ending uh, sort of compulsory need to, to to either go somewhere, to put something out, or yeah, it, it gets a bit heavy. Uh, so you know, I want to take a, a bit of a step back next year. The benefits. Oh, sorry, we've got two questions in the chat. Sure, sure. What's your number one place that you want to go to record that you haven't been yet? That is Antarctica. And it's been my number one place that I wanted to go to for, for a long time. It's not a really uh, cheap place to go to. It's, it, it costs a lot of money. The way I want to do it is I want to charter a yacht myself and maybe have four or five other people join me and a small crew and to sail around South Georgia and Antarctica for at least six weeks, maybe two months, and to land and to record wildlife and to kayak with with marine mammals and to record them with the hydrophones and you know record the geophony and like glaciers and everything and that costs something like two hundred thousand dollars and i've you know i've spoken to skippers and i've spoken about you know the logistics of it it can be arranged and i have a few people i know that would like to join me and we can share some of the costs but it's still we're not there yet uh i will probably ask for support from Sennheiser and a few other of my, my sponsors. And maybe there's a game studio or a film studio out there who's, uh, who's going to be interested as well. Eventually, you know, in a two, two or three, four or five years, maybe I'm going to make that happen. But that, yeah, that's number one for sure. It's not an easy, not an easy target, but uh, we'll see. What are the benefits of for the local people where you make your recordings? Well, there's direct benefits. You know, when I employ them, I like to pay them uh, for their time and for their knowledge and for their efforts. If they're interested, I'm happy to to share their stories and to to talk about them to other of my friends who might be able to to go to those places. Like, you know, when I spoke to Ben earlier, he was asking me for a local guide in um, in Sumatra. So I gave him the details of Brahman. Um, it didn't happen yet, but maybe next year you're going to be able to meet with him. He was an amazing guide and very knowledgeable, very, you know, he was very openly talking about sabotaging the government's efforts to, to cut down the forest. Yeah, he's a, he's a bit of a character, but he's he's very inspiring to work with. Uh, beyond that, I, as I said, I raise money for certain organizations that I really believe in. When I see good work done in the field, I don't want it to, to let go. I don't want to let it go to waste and I don't want it to go unnoticed. So I'm going to mention it if, obviously, if it's safe for, for me, for them, uh, that I do so, but also I'm going to raise money for them and share my, you know, I'm, I'm just giving away equipment, camera traps, that those are very important to have, uh, microphones, teaching them, any way I can help, I, I'm more than happy to help. Um, 
teaching sound recording. This is a big thing, actually. I spoke to several people, uh, one of my friends in Kenya. He He's a good photographer. He has a, a laptop. You know, he knows about data management, this sort of thing. The next step for me is to teach him how to do sound recording. I was there twice in the Masai Mara, and we, we went out recording together. He was observing me at work, and he was very curious, but he didn't say anything for a while until he asked me some very good questions. And that's when I realized that he was actually learning. He was not just there to, to be my guide. So next year, when, I'm, when I'll be going there, I want to spend at least a week with him to explain everything I'm doing, to show how I'm doing things, how I'm copying data, what I'm listening out for. And, you know, hopefully he's going to use this in some some way or another, you know. Whether he's going to become professional or not, you know, that's that's his decision and that's his um, his work that he has to, to put in. But there, there's lots of ways that I can help um, the local people that I work with. George, I have a question um, as we're getting to the end of our final bioacoust talks of the year. Like if you look at Chris Watson, who's another really prominent field recordist, um, what's that album that I love? Um, a Ten Fantasma? No, it's a different one. <clears throat> um, I'll put it in the chat after this, but I he's collaborated with scientists over the last few years on some podcast series. Um, I think the one of the biggest ones was Sea of Noise, all about uh, marine sound pollution. And so I'm wondering if that is something that you're like interested in, a path that you'd consider exploring if there was some either science or conservation related theme that um, you have explored or interacted with through your field recording work, um, some type of collaboration with scientists. Absolutely. I've done that already. So I've, when I was in Senegal in 2017, I recorded a Senegal bush baby for a few hours, actually. I had a rig set up in a tree and it kept calling for a while. And I had someone reach out to me because I had only posted a minute snippet on SoundCloud and they found it and they really, they needed a lot, much longer set of recordings. So I just shared them with with uh, this person. Um, I've, I've done it over several times. Yeah. I think someone using is using some of my YouTube videos to to measure was it exactly i can't remember exactly they got in touch with me but i was in a you know i was traveling so i could i'm not sure i'm more than happy to do this yes the circle of fire i, I remember that i will probably do that do this in the future i will i'm going to look into it uh, a bit more seriously i don't think i have well i don't think i don't have a big enough platform uh to reach as many people as chris does uh, Chris is an amazing person. You know, I was lucky enough to learn from him, to go on a few expeditions with him. He, yeah, when he he does some of this work, he he can reach a lot of people. He can use his platform to to raise awareness about certain things. I would love to do that. That's what I'm working towards. If there is maybe uh, a sort of aim, you know, or something I, I'm aiming for is to have a, a platform through which I can reach enough people and I can raise awareness about issues like that and then give back and help people and collaborate with scientists as well. I am I can probably already do a lot of the work that Chris does with scientists, but I don't think enough scientists know about me yet. And uh, I don't know, there's a way to communicate this as well. I'm not sure that the value I can bring to, to a scientist or to, to some scientific research is very clear. I know how to do certain things you know, I use very different equipment. I'm still exploring this uh, this side of my work. Okay, well, let's see how it develops. Uh, certainly, you've reached a network of bioacousticians here at Bioacoust Talks, and you're well on your way building an exciting platform. And so, um, yeah, it's been really great having you here today with us. Um, for sure, everybody check out George's website, mindfulaudio.com. I think with a hyphen in the middle. Yep. And yeah, let's be in touch. Um, if you have projects that you think would be interesting for George or you've worked in similar areas, um, what's the best way of contacting you? So there's a um, contact form on my website. 
very easy. It just goes to my email and I will get back. Or it's george at mindful-audio.com if that's easier. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I've looking through the list of participants here. I've seen a lot of you um, coming to our sessions over the last year. And so, yeah, thanks for your interest in all of these bioacoustics topics. Um, we'll resume probably back in March, 2024, and it'll be great to start this up again. So really happy to be with you all. George, thanks again, and have a good holiday time and new year. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been a very cool, some very good questions, and I'm very happy to share share all these things with you guys, with you all. I will. I wish you happy holidays, and I'll see you next year. Excellent. Bye, Bye. everybody.